Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the dollar weighted rate of return. And so the dollar weighted rate of return is similar to the internal rate of return, but it's more commonly used for reporting the return or yield of an investment fund on a yearly basis. And so typically when a dollar weighted rate of return is calculated, you need to know the initial balance of an account or a fund and the ending balance of that account or fund for the year that you are interested in reporting on. And so because there are some similarities between the dollar weighted rate of return and the internal rate of return, if you haven't watched our video on the internal rate of return, I would recommend that you watch that first. I'll have it linked here for you to click on. But there is a big difference between the dollar weighted rate of return and the internal rate of return, which is that the dollar weighted rate of return is based on simple interest, not compound interest, like the internal rate of return was. And so when we looked at the internal rate of return, we accumulated interest using the accumulation factor of one plus the interest rate to the power of t. But when we use the dollar weighted rate of return, we are going to use the simple interest accumulation factor, which is one plus i times t, right? And so if you're not familiar with simple interest rates, we also have a lesson on that that you can check out that I'll have linked here for you to click on. But if you are familiar with simple interest rates and the accumulation factor for simple interest, then calculating the dollar weighted rate of return is actually a fairly simple process. And so for a scenario where we have an investment fund or an account of some kind, and we are given the initial balance, any cash flows, and the final balance of that fund for a particular year, then we can calculate the dollar weighted rate of return. And so let's consider the following scenario. Let's say that an investment manager has a fund of $100,000 at the beginning of 2019. On July 1st of that same year, a new deposit of $110,000 was made, and at the end of the year, the balance of the fund was $220,000. And of course, we want to find the dollar-weighted rate of return, right? And so similar to the problems for the internal rate of return, when you want to find the dollar-weighted rate of return, your problem is going to explicitly tell you to solve for that rate. Okay, so it's going to be very obvious when you have a problem that is looking for a dollar weighted rate of return because it's going to straight up tell you. All right, and so notice that in this problem, we are looking at a time period of just one year, right? We're looking at the year of 2019, where at the beginning in January, we have a balance of $100,000. And then on July 1st, we have a deposit of $110,000. And at the end of the year, which would be December 31st, we have a balance of $220,000. Okay, and so this is also slightly different than when we calculated the internal rate of return because the internal rate of return could be calculated for a time period greater than one year. But typically when you're calculating the dollar weighted rate of return, you are only going to be looking at one year and what is taking place in that fund or account for that year. All right, and so let's set up a timeline for this scenario. That's going to help us determine how to set up our equation of value, which will allow us to solve for the dollar weighted rate of return. And so in this case, we have three moments in time that we are interested in, right? We are interested in the beginning of the year where we have this initial balance. And then we are interested in July 1st, where we have a deposit of 110,000. And then we are interested in the end of the year where we have a final balance of 220,000. So when we draw our timeline, we're going to have three moments in time to make note of. And so I'll draw our timeline here. And our first moment of time will be January 1st of that year. Our second moment in time will be July 1st of that year. And our final moment in time will be the last day of the year, which is December 31st. Okay, and so we know that the amount in the fund at the beginning of the year is $100,000. So I'll write that. And then on July 1st, we are making a deposit of 110,000. And so in order to label that as a deposit and that we're not looking at the balance of the fund, I'm going to put either a plus or a minus sign in front of that amount, depending on whether it is a deposit or a withdrawal. And so in this case, it's a deposit. And so that money is being added into the fund. And so we will have plus 110,000, right? That plus indicates that this is an amount entering the account. It is not the balance of the account. That's important to remember, specifically when we get into our next lesson, when we look at the time weighted rate of return, where we will actually be looking at the balance of the account at these particular moments in time as well. But for now, just focus on the fact that this is a deposit. And so we will label that with a plus sign. 
All right, and then for our final moment in time, the balance of the fund is $220,000. And so I'm just going to write that number out explicitly with no plus or minus. This is the balance of the fund at the end of the year. And so we just write it as such. All right, and so if we're going to set up the equation of value in this scenario, remember that the dollar weighted rate of return is based on simple interest. And so we will be using the accumulation factor of one plus I times T and so we're going to need to know the value of t at each of these moments in time. Okay, so we'll say that the beginning of the year is going to be time equals zero, and the end of the year will be time equals one, right? Because this timeline just spans the length of an entire year, right? That's always going to be the case when you're working with the dollar weighted rate of return. Your timeline is just going to take place for an entire year. So you can label the beginning with t equals zero, and the end with t equals one. And so in between, we are going to have a fractional value of time. And that's going to be based upon what month you are in, assuming that the deposit or the withdrawal is made at the beginning of the month. Okay, and so we'll look at that a bit more closely when we actually set up our equation of value. All right, and so let's work on that right now. The way that we are going to set up the equation of value here is to value this investment fund at the end of the year right, we're going to set up a future value equation where the balance of the fund at the end of the year is the future value of any cash flows and the initial balance. And so in this case, we will have that 220,000 is equal to the value of this initial balance and this cash flow or this deposit at the end of the year. And so we need to accumulate each of these values to that moment in time, right? We need to value them at time equals one. And so we'll start with the initial balance of the account. We'll have $100,000 times the accumulation factor for simple interest of one plus I times our value of T. And so in this case, how much time is there from this moment in time to the end of our timeline? Well, that's going to be one whole year, right? We need to value this balance at the end of the year. And so we're just going to multiply that by one because that will represent the entire year. All right, and so we'll multiply by one, and then we will add our deposit of 110,000, and that will be accumulated by multiplying it by one plus I times T, the amount of time that is between when that deposit is made and the end of the timeline, or the end of the year. And so in this case, how much time is between July 1st and December 31st? Well, we'll just count the number of months between those two moments in time, and that will tell us the value of T, right? So if we're starting with July, we have that whole month of July that this is going to accumulate interest for. And so if we're keeping track of the months, we'll have July, and then August, and then September, and then October, November, and all of December. And so we have one, two, three, four, five, six months left in the year that this deposit will generate interest for. And so that is six out of the total of 12 months. And so we can represent that time as a fractional value of those six months divided by the total of 12 months. And that will be our value of time. All right, and so now we have an equation of value set up here where the balance at the end of the year is our future value of the initial balance and the deposit. Okay, and so now all there's left to do here is to solve for the interest rate I, and that will be our dollar weighted rate of return. And so unlike solving for the internal rate of return, this is going to be a lot easier to solve for because every interest rate is of degree one in this scenario, right? None of these quantities are being squared. It's always just I times some value of time. And so this is going to be very, very simple to solve. Okay, and so let's start by distributing these values through these quantities. So we're gonna have that 220,000 is equal to $100,000 times one. So we will have 100,000 plus 100,000 times I times one. And so that's just 100,000 times I. And so we will have 100,000 times I plus this $110,000 times one. So we will have $110,000 plus that $110,000 times I times six divided by 12. Now six divided by 12 would reduce to one half. And so we're just multiplying one half and I by this amount 
and one half of 110,000 would be 55,000. And so then we'll multiply that by i, and now we have completed the distribution of this value through this quantity. Okay, and so now what we want to do is add up our like terms, right? We have 100,000 and 110,000 that are not being multiplied by i, and then we have 100,000 and 55,000 that are being multiplied by i. And so if we clean up our work here, we will have that 220,000 is equal to these two numbers added together. So we will have 210,000 plus these two terms added together. So we will have 155,000 times i. And then if we subtract 210,000 from both sides of the equation, we will have 10,000 is equal to 155,000 times i. Right, if we subtract 210,000 from this side, it's gone. And then if we subtract it from this value, we'll just be left with 10,000. And so now all we have to do to solve for i is to divide both sides by 155,000. And so we'll have that i is equal to 10,000 divided by 155,000. And that will be equal to about 0.0645 and that is going to be our dollar weighted rate of return, right? That is going to be the rate that we were looking for in this problem. And so as you can see, solving for the dollar weighted rate of return is a fairly easy process. It's a lot simpler than solving for the internal rate of return. But just as a comparison, let's look at how we would calculate the internal rate of return for this scenario, just so that you can see that those rates would be different and that the way we solve for them is also different. Okay, and so if we clean up our work here, I put our dollar weighted rate of return up here, but let's try and solve for the internal rate of return. And so let's set up our equation of value for that scenario. It's going to be very similar. The only difference is that instead of using the accumulation factor for simple interest, we will be using the accumulation factor for compound interest. And so we will have that this end balance, the future value of 220,000 is equal to the initial balance of 100,000 times one plus the interest rate to the power of time, which in this case would be one because we need to value that amount at time equals one. And so we have to bring it forward one year and so the value of time would be one, but we don't really need to write the power of one. And then we will add the deposit of $110,000, and that will be multiplied by one plus i to the power of six twelfths. Or we could rewrite that to be one half, right? That would be one half if we were to reduce that fraction, right? We determined that there were six months from this moment in time until the end of the timeline. And so that would be one half of a year. And so we just have to compound this deposit for one half of a year. And now we have our equation of value for this scenario if we wanted to solve for the internal rate of return instead of the dollar weighted rate of return. And so in order to solve for the internal rate of return, we are going to need to solve this equation for i. And so what I'm going to do is subtract this value from both sides, and then we will have a hidden quadratic equation that I will show you how to solve. And so if we subtract this amount from both sides of the equation, we will have that zero is equal to 100,000 times one plus i plus 110,000 times one plus i to the one half power minus 220. Thousand. Okay, and so what we can do here is set one plus i to the one half power equal to x, right? If we let x equal one plus i to the one half power, then would you agree that x squared would be equal to one plus i, right? If we squared x, we'd have x squared. And if we squared this quantity, that would get rid of this one half power. And so we would just have one plus i. And so we can replace one plus i right here with x squared and this quantity of one plus i to the one half power with x, and we will have a quadratic equation that zero is equal to 100,000 times x squared plus 110,000 times x minus 220,000. Now to make this a little bit easier to work with, I'm gonna reduce these terms by a factor of 10,000, right? If we divide each of these values by 10,000, it will make the coefficients a lot more manageable to work with because we are going to need to use the quadratic formula to solve for x in this equation. And so if we clean up our work and we reduce our terms by a factor of 10,000, we will have that zero is equal 
to 10 times x squared plus 11 times x minus 22. And now we have a much more manageable equation that we can work with to solve using the quadratic formula. Okay, and so remember, the quadratic formula says that x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, where a, b, and c correspond to the coefficient of our terms in our quadratic equation, right? So in this case, 10 would be a, b would be 11, and c would be negative 22. And so we will have that x is equal to negative 11 plus or minus the square root of 11 squared minus 4 times 10 times negative 22 divided by 2 times 10. Okay, and so then if you plug this into your calculator, you will get two values of x. You will find that x is equal to negative 2.1319 and some more decimals, or you'll find that it is equal to 1.0319 and some more decimals. But we're not going to want to use this negative value of x. We are going to want to use the positive value. And so I'll cross out that negative value and we can use this value of x to solve for our internal rate of return. And so if we clean up our work here, we can use this value of x to solve for i in this equation. And so we'll have that 1.0319 squared is equal to one plus i, and that will be equal to 1.0648, and that is equal to one plus i. And then if we subtract one from both sides of the equation, we will find that i is equal to 0.0648, which is equal to the internal rate of return. And so now you can see that the internal rate of return is just slightly different than the dollar weighted rate of return. And so these are two different rates. And so you need to be sure that you know which one you are calculating in a particular scenario. But like I said at the beginning, it's gonna be fairly obvious which one you're going to want to calculate because your problems are going to explicitly tell you that they want to know the internal rate of return or the dollar weighted rate of return. Okay, so it's usually very obvious which rate you wanna solve for. Just remember that the internal rate of return deals with compound interest but the dollar weighted rate of return deals with simple interest and is only going to be calculated for a time period of one year. All right, and so with that, that is the end of this lesson. If you wanna see some more example problems of calculating the dollar weighted rate of return, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments, but if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now, so I will see you next time.